we've been studying about faith. We've been talking about uh, we walk by faith in a series of messages this month. And faith is dependence upon God that always requires that we act in accordance with his word. If I depend on God, that faith, that dependence will be lived out in accordance with God's word. And we've looked at several examples of faith. We saw a man, Jairus, who had faith to overcome. His daughter was sick. His daughter died, but he had faith to overcome. We saw a woman with an issue of blood, and she had faith to be made well. Last week, we saw Jesus teach two blind men that at times God works in our life according to your faith. But today, we come to something that few people probably relate to faith at all, and that is the faith to forgive. While as Christians, we probably and should recognize that we must have faith to be forgiven, very few of us realize that many times it's going to take faith in God if we're going to forgive other people. Or actually, I just thought of this on my way up to the stage here, um, it might take faith in God to forgive ourselves. It's going to take faith to forgive. We open up to a passage of scripture where we see one of the few requests that the disciples had of Jesus. It's sort of like a prayer request. We know that in Luke chapter 11, they asked Jesus to teach us to pray. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. That's a great request. If you struggle with praying, why don't you ask God to help you? But then we come to a request here today where the disciples ask for increased faith. That's another great request. But the context of that, and I've often overlooked this in my study, the context of their request for increased faith was God's command to forgive. And so Jesus tells them about forgiveness and that he's going to talk about the fact that someone may sin against you and come seven times and you have to forgive them. And the disciples are warned what happens if they don't. And the warning is so powerful and so clear to them that they're overwhelmed and they realize they can't do it. And so they say, Lord, increase our faith. That's another great thing. Listen, if you're overwhelmed and you realize you can't do it, whatever it is, ask God for faith. Ask him to help you. Well, this is what we see the disciples doing today. So Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse number one. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare your something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all these things which, are command, which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, for he, we have done what was our duty to do. Let's pray together. Father, teach us your word today. And as we prayed earlier, we need to meet with you. And now in this important issue in our hearts about forgiveness, Lord, we need to meet with you. I pray that you will increase our faith and you will break our hearts if we're living with unforgiveness in them. And if there's one who's never been forgiven, Lord, may they find 
faith to trust in Jesus Christ and have their sins forgiven today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to walk right through this text and tell you what's going on here because there's a lot. And we're going to actually get to what I want to talk about at the end of the sermon. But you're going to see how Jesus lays this out about forgiveness and about faith. And so let's dive in and see what he teaches us about. The first thing I want you to note that he talks about is the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin. Boy, if there's not something that we need to be awakened to and brought to understanding is the seriousness of sin. We don't take sin serious. I'm not talking about American culture. I'm talking about the church. We don't even take sin serious. But when you read this text that we just read and you think about it and you let the word sink in, you cannot help but see how serious Jesus is about sin. Now, if you read the context of Luke 17, it starts over in chapter 16. And in that chapter, he's warning the Pharisees about their love of money and the fact that while they were religious, they did not have real faith. And he ends chapter 16 with the, with the teaching on the rich man and Lazarus. If you know what that's about, it's about a man who, who was rich, but he died and went to hell. It's the most graphic teaching in the Bible about hell. It describes an individual in there who wanted a touch of water on his tongue. He ends that chapter and he begins here. He moves from warning the rich, man, the rich Pharisees who were lovers of money about going to hell. And he turns and warns his disciples about the seriousness of sin in their lives. This is not a warning to these ungodly Pharisees. This is a warning to these people who are walking close with him every day. And he is going to lay out the seriousness of sin. Two things he says about this. One, he speaks of the impossibility of sin's absence. The impossibility of sin's absence. Jesus said there in verse 1, It is impossible that no offenses should come. Now think of who said that, Jesus. Go read the Gospels. You don't hear Jesus talking about impossibilities very often. I mean, if you could do what Jesus did, would you walk around saying, well, that's impossible, that's impossible? No. Jesus talked about things like this. What's impossible with men is possible with God. But you come to this place, and Jesus said, it's impossible that there be no offenses in this life. Regarding sin and snares and temptation... Jesus says, it's impossible that you live in this life without facing them. Jesus uses the word offenses, translated here in the New King James in verse 1. He uses the word sins in verse 3, and they basically are tied together. The word offenses in the Greek New Testament is the Greek word scandalon. We get our word scandalous from our scandal from it. It originally was used to describe bait on a stick in a trap that was set to trip and either trap the animal or kill the animal. Later on, it became used to, as translated a snare or a stumbling block. You may have a Bible that uses one of those words, snares or stumbling blocks. Even some translations translate this word temptation. And it means anything that hinders someone else from doing what is right or causes someone to sin. Jesus is going to say it's impossible to live in this world without things that will snare us and cause us to sin. We're going to sing a song. In the, at the, we sing regularly and here in the invitation, Amazing Grace. We all know that song. But do we ever think about what we're singing? John Newton wrote that song and he says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that led me safe thus, thus far and grace will lead me home. Well, I want to tell you, I don't think Newton's just talking about physical dangers and physical snares and, and material snares and health snares. No, he's talking about sin snares that he's come through. Snares that would destroy his life spiritually and morally because sin was abounding all around him. And he said, I've come through them by the grace of God and I'm going to go home home by the grace of God through them because they're everywhere so Jesus when Jesus tells you something's impossible you can mark that down Jesus said it's impossible the second thing though he says is the responsibility for sin snares the impossibility of sin's absence but notice the, the responsibility for sin snares 
He continues there in verse 1. But woe to him through whom they do come. Woe to him. The word woe is a word of judgment in the Bible. You will find it in many chapters that are judgment related. If you read your Bible, you go home today, you read Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 is a chapter full of woe. Woe to this person, woe to that person. All the things that was going on in Isaiah's day before God judged Israel. All the sin that was in their life. He, he pronounced it woe upon them. You read Matthew chapter 23. Jesus spoke woe to the Pharisees. Woe to you. And he, over and over again he called them whitewashed tombs. He called them people who led men astray. Woe, woe. It was a word of judgment. Here Jesus says woe to him who lays a snare for one of these little ones. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about children there specifically. He was talking about children metaphorically. Now, some believe that Jesus is talking about new Christians, young Christians, and certainly he is. I just happen to believe he's talking about any Christian because I happen to believe all through the Bible God calls us his children John writes in 1 John, little children. Well, they weren't little children. They were, most of them were grown adults who got saved. But no matter how much you grow in this life, you will always be short of full maturity. Do you agree with that? Spiritually, you will never reach full maturity in this life. And God is always going to be a father who watches over us because we are little children. And Jesus says, woe to the one who lays a snare for one of God's little children. For one of God's children that he has saved. He points out, he says, to him through whom they come. Through these snares come. Listen, snares come through one of two sources. There's only two sources for snares ultimately. The devil and people. There's two sources for snares. Now the world snares us, but the Bible tells us that Satan is the God of this world. And men are the actors in this world. This world in itself is neither good nor evil until you put Satan in it and until you put men in it. The wickedness in your world is done by the power of Satan through the will of man. Snares come through one or two sources. They come through Satan and they come through men. Paul writing to Timothy about a pastor says this in 1 Timothy 3, 7. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The devil's trying to snare the pastor. He's trying to snare you too, by the way. But here specifically, the Bible's telling us that the enemy has a snare he's trying to lay for the pastor. Now let me be clear. Every single person is responsible for their own sin, their own choices, and the sin that rises in their hearts. But I don't know if you know this or not, and you should. In America, we live in a victim culture. See, we're all victims of something, and so therefore there must be some reason why we do what we do. Somebody must have done something to us that caused us to do what we do. So when you have a massive shooting in a school in Florida, they're all trying to figure out what caused this young man to do this. What caused this young man to do this is he is a wicked and ungodly sinner. That's what caused this young man to do it. Did he have other sinners around him that hurt him? Yes, he did. We all have. Anybody that laid a snare for that young man will stand in God's judgment, but that young man will stand in God's judgment because he created victims we ought to be more worried about his victims than is he a victim but in America we always have an excuse but let me tell you when you stand before God the victim culture is over and so if you're doing things right now and you're blaming somebody else you need to get over it like ASAP as soon as possible Preferably before you leave this place today. Because you could stand before God and he does not accept victim culture. So Jesus said, woe to the man through who this comes. And he tells us that snares come from the devil, but snares also come through people. And you know what? Snares come through me. I'm one of those people. 
James 1, 14 and 15, look at this verse. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, that desire that draws me away is enticed oftentimes by the snare of another. Now, I'm responsible, and you're responsible for being drawn away. But if somebody lays a snare for you, they're also responsible for the snare. I'm responsible for my own choices, but I'm also responsible if I snare you. If I lead you astray, I'm responsible. Especially if you're a Christian. John MacArthur writes about this. He says this, The world is filled with traps which can seduce the unwary into error regarding the scriptures. Did you know every cult in America started out of a church? People who went to a Bible-believing church. There's a lot of cults where the people who started those cults attended Baptist churches. And they twisted the scriptures. Regarding the scriptures, regarding salvation, people are, people are twisted about salvation. And regarding living the Christian life. Now listen to what he says. Those who set them do so by means of direct temptation, indirect temptation, sinful example, and failing to stimulate righteousness. Can you imagine, as a Christian, standing before God and you're responsible for leading some Christian to sin? You're the Christian who, because you have liberty, you, have some, you hand somebody a drink and they become an alcoholic. I know stories of Christian people who were handed their first drink by another Christian. And now they're an alcoholic. Now the other person can handle theirs. But my question is, can you handle giving an answer to God for that? Because in a minute, I'm going to tell you how serious he takes it. When we look at this next verse, and if that don't scare you, you ain't got no scare in you. Can you imagine being the Christian who introduces somebody to gambling and it ruins their life? Can you imagine being the person, the Christian, who introduces somebody to pornography and they become addicted. Can you imagine standing before God and you've lived such a callous, indifferent Christian life and you modeled such ungodliness for the people around you, your children and your family, and you lay a snare for them? Because listen, let me tell you something. You're either somebody's example or you're somebody's excuse. That's the way it is. I, I promise you right now, if somebody knows you're a Christian, you're either their example or you're their excuse. So, Jesus says, woe to that man to who it comes. And look what happens next. Verse 2, it would be better. I told you he had a word of judgment. Verse 2 is a word of warning. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. This verse is absolutely amazing coming from Jesus. This is Jesus, meek and mild. This is Jesus full of love. This is Jesus full of kindness. This is Jesus who knows the seriousness of sin. He uses the word millstone. It's a massive stone used to grind grain. And it's, listen to this. This is interesting. When it was first written in the Greek language, it was called a donkey stone. Because it was such a massive stone that the only way you could move it, usually, was to tie it to a donkey. It was a stone that would lay flat on another stone. They would tie it to the donkey and they would have the donkey go in circles. You ever seen this? This donkey would go in circles. This massive stone, they would put grain under it. And this massive stone would turn as the donkey pulled it. And it would grind this grain. And then it would take several people to lift it up and get the grain out from under it. And Jesus says, it would be better off for you to have one of these massive donkey stones around your neck. And to be thrown to your drowning death. Than to cause somebody to stumble into sin. I don't know. That's pretty serious. That's pretty serious. You, don't, you usually don't get that in the children's Sunday school wing. 
That's pretty serious. These are the words of Jesus. You know, if you were in the South, we'd say it like this. It would be better for you to get some cinder block swim trunks (laughs) and a brick life preserver and go swimming than to lead somebody astray from God. Now, you may say, man, listen, that's harsh. That's unbelievable. That's harsh. Listen, Jesus knows the seriousness of sin. He knows it more than anyone. He was the one that said this in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus took sin serious and he's telling us, listen, you would be better off to go through life maimed to get to heaven than to die with your full body and go to hell. And this is why the cross is what it is, folks. Do you realize Jesus was maimed? They pierced his hands. They pierced his feet. They put a crown of thorns in his head and they put a a spear in his side. Jesus was maimed for our sins. This is why the cross is so glorious that he would take the seriousness of sin upon the blessed son of God and let sinners like you and I live where we won't have to cut off our hands and we don't have to pluck out our eyes and we don't have to tie millstones around our neck because God is forgiving God through grace. This is the cross. And that's why the cross is what it is. Listen, the cross is a brutal death because sin is brutal. The cross is a shameful, despicable death because sin is shameful, brutal, and despicable. And we walk through life with no no clue how serious it is. And then we have to stand before God in all of our shame and all the brutality that hasn't been forgiven. This is what Jesus is telling us. Therefore, for this reason, we need to live out Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another. You can cause somebody to stumble in any way. You can judge them and stumble them. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Resolve. Whatever it is that I have to do, not to put a stumbling block in your way, I need to do it. Now, I know we're Americans and we think every dog for himself. Everybody for himself. I'm my own man. You're your own person. But the Bible says it's so serious that you hurt somebody else. You'd just better, it'd be better off to die than do it. That pretty much tells me that this is not just about me. It's about me and all the folks around me. So, the seriousness of sin. Secondly, Jesus teaches us about the requirement of forgiveness. The requirement of forgiveness. Verse 3 and 4, Jesus teaches, begins to teach about moving. He moves from offending to being offended. He's going to move from sinning to being sinned against. He says there in verse 3, look at this statement. Take heed to yourselves. You may have a translation that says something like, be aware or be alert Be on your guard. The idea is watch yourself that you don't sin, verse number one and two, and cause someone to sin, but also watch yourself when others sin against you. And this is where forgiveness comes in. So the first thing is this requirement of forgiveness is commanded by the Lord. He says, take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you. Well, he just told us it's impossible for it not to happen. The idea is... When it happens, you're going through your business, your money, your, and your brother sins against you. When it happens, you need to respond properly. And he's going to tell us how to respond properly when people sin against us. Now, particularly, listen, particularly when Christians sin against us. I wish I could tell you that that didn't happen here, but I would be sinning against you because I'd be lying to you. So when my brother sins against me, what do I do? And let me tell you, I don't know hardly, I know hardly anyone that does this the way Jesus says do it. Therefore, we don't get the results that Jesus says we will get. The first thing is, there it is, a reconciling rebuke. Verse 3, he says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Back that up. I'm not ready there just quite yet. Uh, He says, 
rebuke him. It is a strong word of disapproval. It would be like a censure or a reprimand that would convey a strong warning and a strong admonishment. It would, meant, it would be mean, meant to uh, wake someone up, to call someone out, we might say in today's language. But notice, when we rebuke, we're to do it with the term, with the idea of reconciling. Jesus said, rebuke him so you can forgive him. Matthew 18, that passage, look what this says. This is the passage people talk about church discipline. Actually, it's really reconciliation is the goal. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him, uh, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So here's a Christian. He sins against me. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to go to my brother. I'm supposed to go rebuke him. Hey, you sinned against me. He won't listen. Imagine that. So then I take two or three other people with me. Now, I don't go tell two or other people, you know what happened? So-and-so said this to me. He really offended me. Let's talk about him over here. Let's talk about how bad a person he is. No, this is what happened. I want to reconcile. Go with me. So then we all go together. Hey, listen, you sinned against this guy. We, we need to get reconciliation. But he won't listen. He won't listen. He's a hardhead. He, he, he lies. He defends himself. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. So then you tell the whole church. What's the whole church supposed to do? Well, they're not supposed to go talk to the people at Walmart about it. You're not supposed to go tell your waitress, yeah, I was down at church. There's some guy down there gossiping about somebody else. No, the whole church is going to say, hey, listen. There's a problem between you and your brother. And we've all heard about it, man. We're urging you to get this thing right. You need to repent. But if he doesn't, you know what we're supposed to do? We're, to teach, we're supposed to teach him like the heathen that he is. We're supposed to teach him like a tax collector, an unbeliever, somebody that you wouldn't have in the, in the, in the fellowship because he doesn't act like a believer. But we don't do this. Instead, what we do is somebody sins against us, and so we, we feel hurt down inside. We nurse a grudge. And we might tell other people what happened to us. We tell somebody else instead of telling the person that offended us. Now, people say, well, I don't want confrontation. Who does? Right. There's something wrong with you if you want confrontation, okay? If you want confrontation, you need counseling, man. <laughs> there is something seriously wrong with you. So if you're thinking, well, I would do it, but I don't like confrontation. Hello? Hello? But that's what Jesus says do. So instead we go tell somebody else. And now that person knows our problem with this person. And now that person is thinking bad about the person. But the person who did it has not been told that they did it. Instead of speaking the truth in love, which is the first step towards reconciling and ending our personal differences, we don't tell anyone or we tell someone else but we don't tell the person who sinned against us. Now I can tell you from experience in this church and other churches, this happens all the time. People ask me, why did so-and-so leave the church? I may not know. Sometimes I do know. Sometimes people say, well, so-and-so did this to me and I'm leaving. Well, did you tell them? No, they want me to go tell them. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say, if your brother sins against you, go tell the pastor. And tell him to tell him that he's a knucklehead. <laughs> but that's not what we do. So if your brother sins against you, go to him. Now listen, about this rebuking thing. If you have no interest in reconciling with someone, then don't rebuke them. Rebuking them is not about pointing out their sin. It's about reconciling with them. So if you just want to let them have it, then just keep it to yourself. And I mean to yourself. Don't go tell somebody else that you work with. Somebody else, we're in the ministry together and I'm, this person ticked me off and I'm going to tell these people over here. No, don't do that. Because now you've sinned. Because Jesus didn't say do it that way. And if Jesus said not do it that way and you do it, you know what that is? Sin. So if you have no interest in reconciling with the person, keep it to yourself. And don't expect them, by the way, to read your mind. 
You know, some people are so sinful that they have no idea they've even sinned against you. This is why Jesus said, go tell him. Now, let me ask you a question, and you be honest. You're in church. Don't lie. And the person I'm talking about is don't lie to yourself. Today, after church, if somebody comes up to you and says, you hurt my feelings by what you said to me, or uh, I heard that I heard you talking and every time I turn around you're gossiping about somebody in church and it, 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 it really offends me and it's causing me to stumble. Or I serve in a ministry with you and every time it's your turn to serve you're never here and just to be honest with you it makes me angry because I have to be there because of you. If somebody come said that to you today and they weren't ugly, they just said it, could you take it? Could you take it? Or would you turn tail and run and never come back? Because the Bible says you need to take it. And then you need to repent. That leads to the second thing. And by the way, before I move there, by taking it doesn't mean you defend yourself. You can't defend yourself and repent at the same time. It's impossible to defend yourself and repent. So a reconcile and rebuke. If you want to reconcile, rebuke. If you don't want to reconcile, don't rebuke. Then secondly, there's a forbearing forgiveness. If the person repents, Jesus says, forgive them. If they repent, if you, reckon, you rebuke your brother and he repents, forgive him. We must learn by this text and by other texts to be in the habit of forgiving. Jesus uses this if he sins against you seven times in a day. And he uses another illustration. Remember in Matthew 18, Peter asked about it and Jesus said, well, if he sins 70 times seven and comes to you, forgive him. What's he, what's, what's he talking about? Because it's, it's, you know, let's just be honest. There's a slight chance that somebody's going to sin against you seven times in a day, but unless they're married to you, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> so outside of that, the idea is this. You're not sitting around keeping a record. Why? Because love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us. I'm about to have a chalkboard marking that you did this. This is the third time you did this. This is the fourth time you did something against me. There's to be a forbearing forgiveness like God forgives us. So if he repents, forgive him. But the question comes, what do I do if he doesn't repent? So what happens in this verse when I rebuke my brother and Jesus says, if he repents, because that tells us there's the possibility he won't repent. That tells us the possibility he will defend himself. Right? Well, if he doesn't repent, do I have to forgive him? Well, I think here's how this works. Mine, your relationship affects not only this relationship, but it affects my relationship with God. So if I sin against you and I defend myself... I didn't repent. For you to stay right with God, you need to forgive me in relationship because if not, you're going to hinder your relationship with God, right? And I personally believe I need to do my best to forgive you. Even at that point, you didn't repent. I need to not hate you. But I can't reconcile with you because you didn't repent. Now, what we do is we act like, we try to act like nothing happened until the next time when the sinner does it again. And then both sins now are in the mix because we did it the first time and I went to that person, I took the chance and the person was so sinful they wouldn't acknowledge it and now they've done something again. I can't reconcile with that person. Because the sin that is in their life and that's hindered the fellowship is, has not been dealt with. 
So, and I believe the Bible teaches this. Jesus teaches this about, about forgiveness in many ways. Mark chapter 11, when he's talking about praying, look at these verses. And when, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Well, that text there says nothing about going to him. The idea is you're praying, you realize there's something against that guy, forgive him so God will forgive you, so God will hear you. This is this relationship with God. This relationship with man, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So I'm going to try my best to forgive you, but we can't reconcile. There's always going to be that because you didn't repent. There's a second thing. I told you it was commanded by the Lord. And then I want to just touch on this. It's, it's also illustrated by the Lord. What is this about the servant? After Jesus answers the apostles' prayer request, they talk about increase our faith. In verse 7 through 10, he comes down and gives us this illustration of a servant plowing or tending sheep. And the servant is out in the field and he comes in and, and Jesus starts to talk about it. He, he's out in the field, he comes in and, and um, are you going to feed him? The word servant there is the Greek word doulos. It's, it's, it's the strongest word for a servant. It actually could be translated slave because Christians need to understand this. We're supposed to be slaves to God and slaves to righteousness. And that slave's duty out in that field, he does his duty. And when he comes in, Jesus says, because he's out plowing the field, are you going to fix him dinner? That's not how it works. He comes in from doing his duty. Are you going to let him eat while you watch? Or are you going to applaud him because he did what he was supposed to do? Jesus said, no, that's not how it works. What Jesus is teaching us here is, and I know this drove the, the point home to the apostles, it's your duty to forgive. And God in heaven is not going to stand and applaud us just for doing our duty. He wants us to go above and beyond. It is our duty as servants of Christ. That leads us to the last thing we need to talk about. And this is where the sermon is. All this other stuff's been an introduction. You're like, goodness gracious, no! This is short. The sermon's short. The introduction was long. Amen. We need it. We need it. The second thing is the, the third thing is the need for faith. After Jesus teaches them about sinning against one another and, and uh, having a millstone around your neck, and if somebody f sins against you, having to forgive them basically without keeping up with it, the apostles say, Lord, help us. You ever come to the Bible and say, Lord, help me? If you don't, you don't come to the Bible. And you don't come to it correctly. This leads to these men to make the request. There in verse 5. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And upon hearing this, the apostles realized they needed God's help and asked for more faith to receive it. They asked for God's help. And God, give us the faith for, to, to believe you that you can help us do this. They knew they needed divine power and divine presence. And the only way to have it was to have God's help. Warren Wiersbe writes about this. He says this, We might have expected the disciples to respond with the prayer, increase our love. Because we think love is what forgiveness is about. Certainly, love is a key element in forgiveness, but faith is even more important. It takes living faith to obey these instructions and forgive others. Our obedience in forgiving others shows that we are trusting God, look at this, to take care of the consequences, handle the possible misunderstandings, and work everything out for our good and his glory. So we're worried about the consequences if we confront. We're worried somebody will, will be known as a troublemaker if we say something. We don't want people misunderstand, so we don't say anything, and we just leave. We don't trust God to work it out. Sometimes we don't give people the chance to repent. The prayer of faith that needs to be in our heart regularly, we need our faith increased in every way, but just think about it. When we face the difficulties of forgiveness, we need more faith to trust God. God. 
The second thing Jesus speaks of is the reality. Verse 6, Jesus says, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Jesus tells them this, basically. Here's the reality he says to them. Men, if you have the smallest seed of faith, you have enough. If you have the smallest seed of faith, and that is a mustard seed... Now, that would have been the smallest seed the people of Israel would have even been able to imagine. It was the smallest seed they they, they knew. But it's very interesting because it can grow into a large shrub. Mustard plants have been known to reach 15 feet high from a very tiny little seed. So don't think that this was not in their mind when they saw that. The very smallest little seed can become one of the biggest plants we would ever imagine. This is the way faith can be for us. So the biggest task I have, Jesus says, I can have faith. That small amount of faith can help me to reach into the highest task that I have. Then he uses, but he uses an interesting illustration because sometimes, you know, Jesus used this and he talks about mountains. Mountains be cast into the sea. Remember that? But this time he uses the mulberry tree. The mulberry tree is very interesting. It was in a tree with an extensive and deep root system. And uprooting the mulberry tree would be a significant thing to do, particularly without heavy equipment. It would have been one of those things like you would most likely have killed it without uprooting it. You'd have been better off just to cut the thing down because it would have took a massive amount of labor. Do you get the point that Jesus is making? Think about forgiveness. Why do we need forgiveness? Why do we need to forgive? Because true forgiveness always involves pain. Someone has been hurt and there is a price to pay in healing the wound. There is a need for God's help in forgiving. Just like the root system in this mulberry tree, I'll guarantee you there's somebody sitting here today and down below the surface of your life, there's some roots of pain and anger. Maybe even bitterness. And they're taking up deep roots in your life. And listen, you came here this morning, and this isn't superficial stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about people, Jesus said, being thrown into the ocean with a millstone around their neck because of sin. We're talking about pain that reaches deep down into our lives. And affects all of who we are because people have sinned against us. And Jesus says, if you trust me, I can uproot all that in your life. And I can give you peace and victory. That's faith. That's why we need faith to forgive instead of trying to do it on our own and psych ourselves out and talk ourselves into it and let Dr. Phil help us. Why don't we let Dr. Jesus help us? I want to tell you a little story and then we're going to quit. Or maybe then we'll get started. No, I'm talking about we'll get started responding. Larry Nasser was the United States gymnast national team doctor. He was a physician at Michigan State University, and he's now a convicted serial child molester. You may be familiar with this story. It's been all over the news. Nasser's cumulative criminal acts of sexual assault were the basis for the recent sex abuse scandal in the gymnastics team of the United States. He was accused of molesting at least 250 girls and young women including well-known Olympic gymnasts dating as far back as 1992. He has admitted admitted to at least 10 of those allegations. In July of 2017, he was sentenced to 60 years in federal prison after pleading guilty to child pornography charges. I wonder who introduced him to pornography. Because, you know, people get introduced to that stuff. Now they're introducing it to us on their phones. Years ago, somebody used to have to hand it to you or point you to it. Imagine the millstone around that person's neck, along with Larry Nasser's millstone. 
in January, he was sentenced to 40 to 175 years in a Michigan state prison after pleading guilty to seven counts of sexual assault against minors. And then earlier this month, on February the 5th, he was sentenced to an additional 40 to 125 years after pleading guilty to three more counts of sexual assault. At the end of his trial, more than 150 women came forward, women and young girls came forward to give public statements against him, to publicly confront him, to give what's known as victim impact statements. That these were victims. Seven days they testified. Hours and hours of young girls and young women speaking. They ranged from those who he had abused to the parents of those he had abused, even to the mother of one young woman who took her own life because of the shame and the guilt that she felt because of her abuse. One of the most powerful and most famous statements came from 15-year-old Emma Ann Miller when she said this, I have never wanted to hate someone in my life, but my hate towards you is uncontrollable. Larry Nasser, I hate you. I will work on forgiveness as I know that is what God wants. But at this moment, I will leave forgiveness up to him. Now listen, I want, to hear, I want you to hear me. I'm not condemning those young girls or those women. Our justice system does not have enough justice for a person like Larry Nasser. Right. But we need to pray for those young girls. Because if they don't get faith to forgive, Larry will still have them in a prison. But there was another young lady named Rachel Den Hollander. Rachel was the first woman to publicly accuse Larry Nasser of sexual abuse. You need to read her story. Go look it up. She suffered greatly for doing this. People ostracized her. People turned against her. The Michigan State officials and these people tried to slander her. But she kept on. And because of her public confrontation with him there was evidence that turned to be found out that he had been reported before but people had covered it up did you read the Lord to Jesus could you imagine the person that covered it up and he kept on that's a millstone around the neck well Rachel ironically and kind of in God's poetic justice well, not only was she the first woman to publicly confront him, she, I mean to publicly accuse him, she was the last woman to publicly confront him. God gave her a grand stage. Rachel is a Christian. She gave a powerful statement not only of her suffering but of the gospel. And I want to read just a little excerpt from her statement because it is so powerful and something we can all learn from. She's speaking to Larry Nasser now. She says this, in our early hearings, you brought your Bible into the courtroom and you have spoken of praying for forgiveness. And so it is on that basis that I appeal to you. If you have read the Bible you carry, you know the definition of sacrificial love portrayed in it is of God himself loving so sacrificially that he gave, us, he gave up everything to pay a penalty for the sin he did not commit. By this grace, I too choose to love this way. You spoke of praying for forgiveness, but Larry, if you've read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things as if good deeds could erase what you have done. It comes from repentance, which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you have done in all of its utter depravity and horror without mitigation, without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you've seen in this courtroom. The Bible you carry says it would be better for a stone to be thrown around your neck and you thrown into a lake than you to make one, even one little child stumble and you have damaged hundreds. The Bible you carry speaks of a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none, listen to these words, should be found. 
And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me. Now listen to these last words. Though I extend that to you as well. You know what she did? She had faith to forgive. It was God's power in her to forgive him and to tell him the truth. See, sin is an awful, terrible thing. And what's surprising is that we don't hate it. But we don't. It will send our souls to hell. It will destroy every good thing in our lives. And it is the cause of every bit of pain that we live with day by day. And that we experience through our televisions. And we don't hate it. But we need forgiveness. You may need to forgive somebody today. Maybe you haven't had the power and you've tried. You've tried to muster it up. But those people keep doing stuff that cause you to hurt and cause you to hate. You're going to have to have faith to forgive. Because it's not a love issue, it's a faith issue. Because Jesus can turn hate to love. He can turn judgment to grace. You have to have faith. Some of you today are going to have to ask God to help you. No counseling is going to do it. It's going to take you asking God, increase my faith. So I can forgive. Some of you may be a person that somebody confronts. It's going to take humility to handle a rebuke. And some of you today are sitting in this place and you believe a lot of this stuff that we've talked about. But you've never come to the soul crushing weight of your guilt. You know why? Because you're always defending yourself. I'm not a bad person. Listen, if you've ever told yourself that, you've defended yourself under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to defend yourself. There's an advocate with the Father named Jesus. If you run to him, he will forgive you, and then he will defend you all the days of your life. Hallelujah for the gospel. Come to Jesus this morning. Let's pray together.